So we decided to stop guessing and go look in the data. How does the expectations hypothesis work in US data? The central prediction is that when the yield curve is upward sloping, that should be on average followed by higher interest rates. So how did that work out? Well, let's look at times when the interest rate is upward sloping in the data. For example, in the early 1990s, you see a strong upward slope in the interest rate. You see positive yield spreads. And what happened afterwards? Interest rates went up. How about another episode? Early 2000s, strong upward slope in the interest rates, in, uh, in the yields. What happened afterwards? Interest rates went up. Wait a minute, this seems to be pretty good. Strong upward slope in the interest rates in the late 1970s. What happened afterwards? Interest rates went up. Early 1970s, upward slope, interest rates went up. Looks like when there's an upward sloping yield curve, interest rates do, on average, rise, just as the expectations hypothesis predicts. And the opposite. When do we see negatively sloped uh, yield curves? When is the, uh, the long-term rates lower than the short-term rates? Well, at times like early 1980, all the business cycle peaks, uh, all the moments just before recessions, seems to be times when the yield curve is slightly downward sloped. So what you can see on the graph, on average, there's an upward slope in the yield curve. <clears throat> on average, there's a small risk premium to long-term bonds. But um, uh, the time variation, which is the interesting part, does seem to see, show this pattern that upward sloping yield curves are followed by interest rate rises. Downward sloping yield curves are followed by interest rate declines. Uh, the market seems to be calling it pretty well. Well, so much for eyes. Let's go look at numbers. Uh, and here we'll look at the Fama Bliss regressions, uh, which I've written out on the board. So the first regression is we run the excess return of a long-term bond on the forward spot spread uh, uh, beforehand. Now let's stop and think a minute. What do you expect for this coefficient under the expectations hypothesis? What does the expectations hypothesis predict if I run the excess return of a long-term bond on anything, really, at time t? Uh, what value of b should I get? I hope the answer you came to was 0. Nothing should forecast returns. Uh, that's just like all the standard random walkie kind of tests that we've been doing all along. Now let's look at the other regression that we're going to run, the change of interest rates. This is next year's interest rate minus this year's interest rate. We're going to run that on the forward spot spread. And we're matching maturities. This n is the same as that n. So for example, the five year, uh, the five year forward, we're going to look at the uh, interest rate four years from now, from year four to year five. What does the expectations hypothesis predict for that one? Is that one 0, 2, or is there some other number? I hope the answer you came to there was 1. If the forward rate is 1% higher than the spot rate, the spot rate should go up 1 percentage, uh, 1 percentage point next year. That just comes from forward rates are expected future spot rates. OK, that's what we expected to see. Let's go see what the facts say. The facts say the two-year forward rate uh, is two, three, four, five-year forward rates are almost moving one to one with expected returns on their bonds next year. This number isn't zero. These numbers are close to one. Forward rates seem to indicate one for one movements and expected returns on their corresponding bonds over the next year. There is a time varying risk premium bonds, just like we saw in stocks. The dividend yield forecasts stock returns. The forward spot spread is forecasting bond returns. Now, one is a particularly interesting number. Let's look over at this number here, the two-year forward rate. So when the two-year forward rate is above the one-year uh, interest rate, that should be 1.0. That should say that interest rates go up next year by one percentage point. Instead, it's pretty darn close to zero. The two-year forward rate is not doing anything to tell us where interest rates are going a year from now. So that's, bad. The, that's similar bad news for the expectations. This was also ba bad news for the expectations hypothesis, good news for bond traders. Um, now, once we go out to five years, things change. At five years, the uh, uh, forward rate 1 percent above the spot rate seems to predict interest rates go up by exactly the 1 percentage points they're supposed to go. So that number is roughly 1. That number is roughly 0. So what have we learned? We've learned that the expectations hypothesis is a bloody disaster at the one-year horizon. It is exactly 100% wrong. <laughs> the number that should be 0 is 1. The number that should be 1 is 0. This is just not working at all. At the five-year horizon, the number that should be 1 is about 1. I haven't shown you the corresponding number that should be 0, but it is also about 0. 
Um, let's put that together with uh, our graphical presentation. So this is the same graphical example. Suppose the price was um, uh, minus uh, 0.20 and minus 0.05. We concluded the expectations hypothesis said in that circumstance, we should see the one-year rate of return uh, being equal across maturities. Well, what Fama and Bliss say is no. It goes here instead. The forward rate is exactly equal to the expected return on the one-year bond, on the two-year bond. It's not equal to where the interest rate is going next year. And likewise, the fact that the forward rate is very high tells us nothing about where interest rates are going next year. The plot shows you why this number, 0.17, and that number, 0.83, add up to one. <laughs> because it's got to be one or the other. Either we make a lot of money in the first year, or interest rates are forecast to change. At a one-year horizon, we make a lot of money in the first year. It's not that interest rates change. So uh, why did our eyes fail? We had this beautiful graph. We concluded the expectations hypothesis was right. Where did we go wrong? Well, we go wrong because we got impatient. Look through the episode, for example, the early 2000s. The, the forward rate is above the spot rate for four years. It keeps saying, the interest rate rise is coming. It doesn't happen. The interest rate rise is coming. It doesn't happen. The interest rate rise is coming. It doesn't happen. It, if you get four years of making a lot of money, and then finally the interest rate rise happens. The long-term rates are saying the interest rate rise will happen four years from now. That one's about right. So in fact, it, uh, these graphs, if you look at them more carefully and quantitatively, show you exactly where you're making money is in recessions, you are being paid to hold interest rate risk. Why? Because the yields are higher, but the interest rate rise doesn't come as long as the recession keeps going on. So that's the natural interpretation of this phenomenon. Yes, the expectations hypothesis failed. There is a risk premium. It's large. And you get paid to hold interest rate risk in recessions. That's the, that's the message of Fama and Bliss. There's been a lot of more recent work on this, one by me, which I'm rather proud of, where we add other variables. We don't just look at forward spot spreads. We add other variables to forecast returns. What we found is that R squareds rise up to 44%. You can forecast a lot of bond returns. And the pattern is, the, the way in which we forecast better, Fama and Bliss's regression tell you if, if you're an investor or it tells you the risk premium is constant throughout the recession. Everywhere in the recession, you get an expected return so long as the forward rate's above the spot rate. The extra variables seem to have the ability to tell you to stay in in this period when, when you're earning more yield and interest rates are, 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 are not going up. And they seem to be able to tell you some indication of when it's time to get out, when in fact that the expectations hypothesis is going to kick in and you're not going to make much money. This pattern happens everywhere. This is the same pattern you saw in dividend yields and stock returns. High prices relative to dividends forecast a risk premium, not increases in dividend growth. High forward rates relative to spot rates forecast a risk premium, not an increase in spot rates. It shows up in foreign exchange. High foreign interest rates relative to US interest rates do not forecast a depreciation. The number should be minus one. The number is, in fact, closer to plus one. High foreign interest rates relative to US interest rates do forecast a rate of return. That's called the carry trade, or the uncovered interest parity puzzle. You get paid to hold a risk premium to hold high interest rate currencies and to borrow from low interest rate currencies. What's the macroeconomics behind it? Well, you can sign a sense macroeconomics. You get paid to hold interest rate risk in recessions. You get paid to hold high interest rate uh, countries. We have to write down macro models to find out why that are, that are still in their infancies. But that's the facts.